Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Aaron Blade, and I'm the creator, editor, and producer of what you're watching right now, Blade Talk. If you are new here, welcome, and you found this presentation helpful, informative, do me a huge favor, hit that like button, do me an even greater favor, and subscribe to my channel. I always appreciate all the support that I'm giving. So today, um, I got an interesting um, question, and it was regarding Messianic Jews, right? Are they really Jews? And it was kind of, I guess, you know, how can you say that Reformed Jews are Jews, but not Messianic Jews? You know, which what is the standard by which I am, you know, um, by which I'm judging each of these denominations or movements, right? And I wanted to answer this question in a sense that um, it comes with a caveat, and that is, you know, I'm not the Jewish gatekeeper, right? I'm not in any position to tell someone who is or who isn't Jewish. I can only go based on, you know, Jewish law, halakha, and, you know, what it actually states, right? So I'm going to break down a little bit of what Messianic Judaism um, or what Messianic Jews believe and why they're not um, considered Jewish by, you know, every Jewish movement, whether you're Reconstructionist, Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, Sephardic, um, you know, all of them essentially reject uh, Messianic Jews as legit Jews. And I'm going to explain why. But first, hit that intro and let's begin. Okay, let's get into this. Messianic Judaism um, basically um, is a movement of Protestant Christianity that incorporates some elements of Judaism and other Jewish traditions into evangelicanism, right? So it emerged out of, in, uh, out of the 1960s and 1970s from a popular group known as Jews for Jesus, which I spoke about, see my earlier um, episode on Jews for Jesus, founded in 1973. Okay, so it's a relatively um, new group. Um, it was founded by Martin Rosen, a, a, an American minister under the Conservative Baptist Association, right? So right off the bat, Messianic Judaism, to me, Messianic Jews aren't legit Jews because the founder, it wasn't Jewish to begin with, right? He was a member of the Baptist, um, Baptist movement, right, in Christianity. So, you know, to me, I associate them with just a Christian denomination, Right. And I, you know, my measuring stick is per, is simply this. OK, there are two things. One, how did that particular movement that you were in? Um, what was this? It's founding. Right. And second, Torah. Torah is the the center of, you know, Jewish life, in my personal opinion. Right. This is just my personal opinion on it. Torah is how you regard Torah is how I'm going to know whether or not essentially you're Jewish. Right. So to me, you know, um, when it comes to I, I use that same measuring stick for every um, every Jewish movement. Right. How you regard Torah. Right. Not so much. Are you keeping all the law, all the laws down to a T? Are you no? But do you believe that this book is is final? The Torah is it doesn't need a, a, a sequel. Right. And when I look at the Messianic Jews, they believe in their source of authority is the Old Testament and the New Testament. Right. 
So, right off the bat, you know, they, they try to bridge Judaism and Christianity, right? They, they have been trying to, to ultimately deceive um, and lie to a lot of Jews. They try to claim that there is a way that you can still be Jewish. You can still be Jewish. You can have all of the bar mitzvah, all of that, right? And still accept Jesus at the same time, right? The New Testament, and I will say this over and over again, the New Testament is contradictory to the old. I don't think that those books ever should have been placed together at all because the claims that they make are mutually exclusive. They don't go together, right? The whole idea of, of Torah, of the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, is developing a close relationship with God through fulfilling his mitzvot, right? That is... The, the essence of Tanakh, getting, getting that special relationship with God, right? The New Testament is more so about Jesus and his sacrifice and accepting him um, as your Lord and Savior alongside God, which, of course, as we know in Judaism is a big no-no, right? You do not associate partners with God in any context, right? So a lot of Messianic Jews and Hebrew Israelites will maintain the, the Jewish holidays, the Jewish look, the traditions, whatever the case may be, right? And I always tell them, you can, you can be going on the, the right track, but headed in the wrong direction, and you'll get run over. Right. So to me, like I always look at my measuring stick of whether someone is Jewish, right, is based on how that particular movement came to into existence. Right. And how they regard Torah. Right. You can say whatever you want about the Reconstructionist, the conservative, the reform. The fact is, is that they were started by actual Jews. Those movements essentially were were started by Jews. And there's no debate on that, right? So to me, you know, when I look at Reform, I believe Reform Judaism, Reform Jews are legit Jews in my eyes because they just... To me, they practice the oldest form of Jewish tradition, and that is constantly reinterpreting uh, the world and always subjecting human texts to crit critical analysis, right? And that, to me, is the only real Judaism, if there is such a thing. That's the only real Judaism, right? Because if you think that there is a, a real deal uh, form of Judaism, you'd be sadly mistaken, right? Even in the Orthodox sects or whatever, their history only goes back a couple hundred years. Just a couple hundred years, right? The entire Hasidic movement, you know, began in, the, in Europe in the 17th century, right? Um, so... You can't say that it is the traditional way, right? Rabbinical Judaism as a whole is, you know, no more than 1,500 years old and essentially spread very slowly, right? So ancient Judean Jews wouldn't recognize, you know, rabbinical Judaism as it is today, right? So... You know, divisions among Jews aren't new. The Pharisees, the Essenes, the Sadducees, you know, they're they're not new. But one thing that always that we always had as a foundation was Torah. Right? We always had that as our foundation. Now when you get into, you know, um the politics of it, and I absolutely hate that, the the politics of conversion and whatnot. Right. Um, you know, and, and I always always say, you know, as long as it was done halakhically, you know, I 
don't have a problem accepting anyone as Jewish. I don't care if you if you want to practice reform, conservative, orthodox, Hasid, whatever you want to do is on you. But make sure that either you have a Jewish mother or you convert according to Jewish law, right? Um, you know, I think that some in the reform movement, as I stated before, are a little too lenient in terms of, oh, you don't need a bait dean, you don't need a circumcision, that's so barbaric. No, they really do. Okay, that's Jewish law. And I also think that the Orthodox on the other side of the spectrum are politicizing conversions, right? The Rabbinute in Israel has a list, right? Not kidding. It has a list. It's called the Atim list, right? I-T-I-M has a list of rabbis that they recognize worldwide, you know? So, very popular rabbi on this YouTube platform is Rabbi Tovia Singer. Big fan, love him, absolutely love him. If he converted, you know, someone, and he's an Orthodox rabbi, if he converted someone, that person would not be accepted into the minion in every synagogue, in every shul, right? That person wouldn't be able to make Aliyah, right? Because he's not on that list. All right. So some, you know, some I feel like, you know, take it too far. And, you know, the Talmud itself states that, you know, a man came to Rabbi Hillel, right? One of our greatest rabbis in Jewish history came to Hillel and asked Hillel, Rabbi Hillel to convert him. But he was converting under false pretenses to begin with, right? He stated to Rabbi Hillel, you know, convert me on the basis that I reject the oral law. Convert me on the basis that you make me a high priest. Convert me on the basis that, you know, um, you teach me the entire Torah while standing on one foot. And in every single instance, Rabbi Hillel converted him, right? And then, of course, they began to study together, right? But the point is, I don't think that it should be that hard. And at the same time, we need to um, hold true to our traditions. When it comes to the the messianic jews and whatnot there are only um i want to say there are two hundred and fifty thousand of them worldwide right maybe three hundred thousand somewhere in there and um they took a poll only two to four percent are actually jewish meaning that they had a halakhic conversion or they had a jewish mother two to four percent of two hundred and fifty thousand right so, um, of course, those uh, particular, th those that fall into that 2 to 4%, I actually acknowledge and accept as, as Jews. They're apostate Jews, right? But they are, in fact, Jewish. But the rest of them, it is completely Christian. They're Christians that pose as Jews in order to deceive people. When it comes to the the Hebrew Israelite movement, again, I look at you know, two things. How was it founded and what is your regard for Torah, right? So the Hebrew Israelite movement, it began in the late 19th century by the name of Frank Cherry, who was a Christian. Again, was a Christian. Look at the founder of the movement. It was a Christian, okay? Um, and he had a vision that you know, all black people, Hispanic people, Native Americans, they were all, you know, part of the 12 tribes and, and whatnot. And based off of that vision, he built a church, not a synagogue, a church, right? And, you know, his followers believe in the New Testament and whatnot, and they just practice, you know, Jewish traditions. And that's it. But what's interesting is, you know, uh, they believe that they are the uh, one of the true tribes and the Mexicans are part of another tribe and the Puerto Rican. But what's interesting is you don't hear Mexicans saying, you know, saying this kind of rhetoric, right? When was the last time you met a Puerto Rican Hebrew Israelite or a Dominican Hebrew Israelite? It's only, you know, the the black Americans that are pushing this narrative based off of a vision. But nevertheless, you know, both these groups, the Hebrew Israelites and the Messianics, accept the New Testament to be 
the word of God. And at that point, you're leaving Judaism, right? Because the Torah, as I always say, doesn't need a sequel. The Torah is very clear in terms of, you know, developing and having that relationship with Hashem, right? And it states very plainly, plainly in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, that, you know, you shall not add nor take away, period, right? The New Testament focuses more on Jesus and his and his love and his sacrifice and, and all of that stuff, right? And actually, you know, the New Testament starts to call uh, the Torah a curse. Longest uh, chapter in Tanakh is Psalms chapter 119. And it's King David listing all of the amazing things about the Torah, right? Now, you go from that. It is so amazing. It's delicious. It is a light into my path, right? All of these things that King David stated about the Torah, you flip the page to the New Testament, and all of a sudden it's a burden. It's a curse that we need to rid ourselves from. And the only way to do it is to accept this man, this Savior, and they associate you know, Jesus as a, as a partner with God. And all of that is foreign to Judaism. You've left Judaism. Now, although I will, um, I will agree that the original Jesus movement, Jesus's followers, the disciples were in fact Jews. And the reason that I say that is because they went, you know, if you read the book of Acts after Jesus had departed from this earth, they still, daily attended the synagogue. They still daily attended the synagogue. And you can't go into a synagogue preaching that, you know, this this man died for the sins, all of our sins, and, you know, he um, came back to life and all of that. You can't, you can't go into a synagogue preaching that, right? I believe that Jesus's original followers were Jewish. I do. When Paul came on the scene, and this is almost almost 40 years after Jesus had died, right? Actually, 40 years since he died, came back, left again, whatever. 40 years, um, Jesus appears to Paul, and Paul, you know, begins to preach to the Jews. The Jews rightfully rejected, and now Paul goes to the Gentiles, and so, you know, they weren't promised the Mashiach at all. So it's kind of almost weird that he would go and teach non-Jews and whatnot that were never associated with the law to begin with. But nevertheless, you know, they had their, you know, their Messiah that they blindly follow. And that's, that's it. The mythology is up and running. Right. So, you know, the idea that, you know, Jesus never heard the term Christian in his life doesn't know what a Christian is, right? Jesus, in fact, was Jewish, right? So to me, my measuring stick is always and will always be how did you come to possess these secrets? Because as I tell Hebrew Israelites, nobody else is saying this. The Mexicans aren't saying there's, oh, there's, there's tribes and we're one of them and the black people are the others and you're not saying this. So how did you possess this, these secrets? Right? And to the Messianic Jews, when I approach them, you know, um, this idea of Jesus being divine and, and being the savior and whatnot, how did you possess these secrets? Because it's not written in the Torah. God is perfect. There's 613 minutes vote that we have to follow that allows us to have a special connection with Hashem and get closer to him. 613, not one, teach that a Mashiach is coming and you will need to accept him as your Lord and Savior. Not one. 613, not one. Not one. Right? So, you know, that will always be my measuring stick. I think that, you know, again, when it comes to the, the legit movements in Jude within Judaism, um, the conservative movement, you have, uh, I believe it was um, Rabbi um, 
Zakaria Frankel, I believe, um, was the founder of the conservative uh, movement. And he basically, um, he was in fact Jewish. Um, let me just look that up real quick. I don't want to give false information on here. I want to say it was, um, I want to say it was Rabbi Zakaria Frankel who uh, founded, uh, founded, let me see. Um, yep. Um, Rabbi Zakaria Frankel. I can't believe I doubted myself. But anyway, Zakaria Frankel in the 19th century, right? And he was, in fact, Jewish, right? And what he essentially stated was, was that, you know, we have to be able to adapt to modern times. We have to, you know, concern ourselves with the with the modern world. And when we do, we should just look at it through the lens of the Torah. Okay. To me, nothing is going against, you know, the Torah in the terms of, you know, oh, I have this, this new book and God gave me this new revelation. Nope. None of that. It was just a way to adapt, right? And I look at that the same way I do uh, Reform Judaism, right? Um, with Rabbi... Um, Y'all are really putting me on the spot, huh? Rabbi Abraham Geiger, I believe was his name. Um, Rabbi Abraham Geiger um, pretty much stated that, you know, we have a little bit more influence right in the political realm we don't have to stay in ghettos the world was essentially changing and he wanted to adapt and so what he did was he took the him and another group of rabbis took the ethical portions of the torah and you know um stated that you know you can re remain jewish and you know thrive for a better life right Again, you know, he didn't come out with his own book and God spoke to me and, you know, n none of that. I had a vision and it was just an idea, it was an interpretation, right? And that's vastly different from, you know, Messianic Jews who, you know, were started by a minister and, you know, uh, came up with, you know, a vision that you can still believe in Jesus and accept this New Testament, you know, that says that the old, the, the, that the Torah is a curse. You know, imagine a, a Christian being a Christian, living a Christian life, but also accepting as a source of authority, the Quran, right? Imagine, you know, um, a Christian priest, right, or a pastor or whatever, going up preaching in front of his congregation and says, okay, let's put the New Testament to the side. I want everybody to pull out the Quran and come with me to Surah Bakra, right? No. Or imagine a Muslim, right? And the Imam saying, you know, okay, let's put the Quran aside for a second. I want everybody to break out the Bhagavad Gita from Hinduism, right? No, it's something completely different. I think the worst mistake that that ever happened, one of the worst in 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 the Jewish realm, is that. The New Testament and the Old Testament came together. And they're trying to force it to fit. And the fact of the matter is, is it doesn't. Because Tanakh, the Jewish Bible, is airtight. There is no way that you can add on to it. All right? Now you have the Talmud and whatnot that tries to interpret every letter, every verse of what it is that you're reading right and study and whatnot but the idea that you're adding something onto it that is contradictory to what the torah actually says again you know the new testament calls the torah a curse it's a burden that you have to be lifted from and more so you don't have to follow it anymore because jesus came so you can eat whatever you want you can essentially do whatever you want 
right? So that is just my thoughts on it. You know, on Messianic Judaism, no, they are they are not Jews any more so than the Hebrew Israelites are Jews. They are these are Christian movements, right? The moment that you break out the New Testament and consider it, uh, you know, authoritative to me, you know, you've you've left Judaism at that point. All right. So that being said, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you learned something from this presentation. If you did, do me a huge favor and give me a big thumbs up. Um, please subscribe to my channel. I always appreciate all the support. Thank you all so much for watching and tuning in to Blade Talk. Be good to yourselves. Be good to others. I'll catch you in the next episode. Class dismissed.